The PowerPoint presentation is actually for the audience. The commissioners already have the information here. So we'll pull it back up and get everything back up on the screen for the audience. But in the sake of time and working, as Chairman Hawkins mentioned, as really a workshop for the commissioners, we'll begin that process of talking. Do I need to just start, turn? Okay. Say yes. So back in August, the Board of County Commissioners instructed staff to try to figure out what would be a next step to meet the moratorium that they had adopted earlier in the year. Moratorium was specifically addressed at a biomass facility and trying to prevent that from coming into Transylvania County. It was a request that I think county commissioners looked at to honor a number of citizens in the community and trying to provide time that would allow them and other groups within the county to come up with a, a good way of trying to address a concern here in the community. And that is how do we deal with land uses? How do we deal with economic development? How do we deal with growth? And so what staff has worked on over the last several weeks is putting together a series of alternatives for the county commissioners to consider. There are essentially four alternatives that we'll be talking about this evening. One of those alternatives is to simply allow the moratorium to expire at the end of July 2014. It's an option. I didn't say it was a good option, but it's an option. A second option is to take a look at at the existing Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance and see how you could expand that throughout the county, particularly looking at the corridors, uh, areas that would have the greatest impact by future growth, areas where people in the community, our citizens, our visitors are traveling and would be impacted by new development. A third option is to look at the high impact land uses ordinance that uh, a number of citizens and commissioners worked on as a draft and shared with other groups. Yeah, thank you. High impact land use ordinance is not zoning. It's a standalone ordinance. And then it relies on a number of different specific legislative pieces that the General Assembly allows counties to adopt. A fourth alternative is to look at countywide zoning, uh, something that there are a number of people that we know in the community, in the county, that are very much opposed to, while others are ambivalent or possibly supportive, depending on how it would look. Those are the four options. You might ask, as one of the county commissioners did earlier, why was the Pisgah Forest zoning ordinance identified I'll let you, as number two rather than number three, because it is already zoning. And the reason for that is staff, and Chris Nanton is here. Chris, if you would raise your hand, please. Chris is planner, and he has done a lot of work in helping us put this together. Uh, along with Michelle McCall. It is zoning, but what we were really looking at is the priority in terms of how much time and energy would be required to implement. Obviously, allowing the moratorium to expire requires very little energy. Trying to develop a full zoning ordinance for the entire county would require a great deal of time and energy. As a digression, in the sesquicentennial process that was led by Chairman Hawkins, the Economic Development Advisory Board and Planning Board worked on a countywide survey. And in that survey, 
of the roughly 1,200 households that responded, it was roughly an equal amount that said that they would be receptive to zoning, and then there was that's it, an equal number that said, no, we should not be. And then that demographic was, you could further break that down by the number of generations, people that lived here and their families have been here, and how long they had just been here if they were fairly new to the community. Here we go. Technology. It's good. All right. That's all I'm going to do. Thanks. I've been told which arrows I can push and not push. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are at the process of reporting back to the county commissioners. One thing that I've not mentioned is that in developing recommendations or discussion points for the county commissioners is that I personally contacted almost all of the county commissioners, all of the economic development advisory board members and planning board members as well as business owners, community leaders and asked them if we had to do something along a high impact land uses ordinance or zoning, what would you think? What would be your preference? Uh, as in the sesquicentennial survey, there was a split uh, with some saying, Mark, I really would prefer that we do absolutely nothing. Others saying, I'd like to see a holistic approach taken uh, to how we address this issue. Uh, and some saying, you know, I'd have, just have to see what that final product is. I think the overwhelming consensus, though, was that everybody wanted to see if there was going to be some type of action taken by the county commissioners, that it be business friendly, that it focus on ways to support existing businesses, and that it be fairly simple, that we don't need just a large amount of bureaucracy and more regulations. We've already covered this. All right. So if you look at option one, which is allow the current biomass facility using municipal solid waste moratorium to expire, the pros are fairly simple. Status quo is not changed. That is, it's not changed prior to the adoption of the moratorium. It's back to business as usual. And it requires essentially no additional staff time and effort, although there really needs to be an asterisk next to that. Because over the last 10 years, there has been a considerable amount of staff time and energy that has gone into trying to address land use related issues that we've not been adequately able to do. It's only been through litigation that we've been able to do that. Noise ordinance, racetrack, uh, in the uh, Cherryfield area. Whitmire area. That, that's, it, so to say that it requires no additional staff time and effort is not entirely true. The cons. It doesn't address the bigger issue regarding high impact land uses and other land use concerns. Does not protect landowners and the community from high impact land uses such as a biomass facility a racetrack or some type of manufacturing facility that could have a fair amount of traffic or produce noise or have some type of emissions that while they meet state requirements, which would be US EPA requirements, still would be something seen as perhaps not wanted here in this community. And I think staff would argue that one of the cons is that no action actually fails to proactively enhance economic development. And we've heard this from many different speakers that have come to Transylvania County to speak to the Transylvania Partnership and other groups that have said, you need to be doing something that protects existing businesses and allows the community and future businesses to know where something can go so that it is compatible with neighbors in that community. Implementation timeline, there essentially is none. Option two, 
modify the existing Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance to include the major quarters going outside of Pisgah Forest. Not on this slide, it's just a little bit of background. Several years ago, the city of Bavard looked at taking in the Pisgah Forest Community in what is known as the extraterritorial jurisdiction. The residents from that community, and we have some that are here this evening, made a very loud and very clear cry to the county commissioners that they wanted to see something done that would protect them from the city and the extension of the extraterritorial jurisdiction. Extraterritorial juris jurisdiction basically giving the city the right to control land use and placement of different types of businesses within the area, but they would not have to pay taxes and they would not be able to elect officials in the city of Bavard. County commissioners then tasked staff working with the planning board and others to come up with an alternative that would be satisfactory to the residents of the Pisgah Forest community. It had to be satisfactory to the city of Bavard and obviously it had to be satisfactory to the county commissioners as well because they were the ones that would have to enact this and then provide the funding necessary to staff for adequate enforcement. Planning board did come up with a solution that everybody was able to agree to. May not have been perfect, but it was a solution that everybody seemed to agree on and we've had success with that. It essentially has two zoning areas. It has the corridor provisions, and the corridor provisions look at such things as access, road cuts, types of businesses that would be allowed, and setbacks, particularly setbacks, as they relate to adjoining residents. It's a safety concern. It's also something that we looked at and said, how do we promote the future growth of Pisgah Forest, that 280-64 corridor, so that we don't just have a melee of congestion with just more and more being built up there. The second area that the zoning ordinance addresses is what's called open use. And it essentially allows any type of use there to continue. And then it does have some provisions that if there are specific uses, there will be additional requirements. But basically it is, you can do whatever you want with a property. It is zoned, but it's called open use. I think that's pretty straightforward. Commissioner's questions on that in terms of the Pisgah Forest zoning. Unique to the Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance is the fact that there are certain provisions in the zoning ordinance itself in the corridor mixed district. And I'm going to read this because I think it's important and very instructive for commissioners as you think about this alternative. It's on page 33 of the Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance behind tab 2. And it's Article 14, Corridor and Mixed Use Districts, Section 25. The following sections in this article shall apply to non-residential uses in the corridor mixed use. 25.2, the following uses shall be prohibited in the corridor mixed use. And there are three, hazardous waste disposal facilities, unless permitted pursuant to GS 130A-293, 25.22, radioactive waste disposal facilities, and 25.2, Point three, adult entertainment establishments. The Pisgah Forest community, community, county commissioners, and city of Bavard all thought that these were worthy of excluding from that community. So the point that I'd like to make here is that if the county commissioners in future discussions wanted staff or other groups to look at this, we might want to expand upon that list of uses that are not allowed. And so that's a way of expanding that. Does that make sense? 
So when I talk about option two and modifying the Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance, we're talking about an area that would be primarily along our major corridors, and I'll show you a map, although in the audience, folks, I'm, I apologize, it's not going to show up well, but what the commissioners have will show up a little bit better. But pros are it's an extension of an existing ordinance. We already have it. It's in place, and it seems to be working. It buffers high-impact land use development along corridors that commissioners and hopefully the community could buy into. 500 feet, 1,000 feet from the center line of the road, whatever that measure is. It would or could prohibit certain uses just outright. Um, a solid waste burning facility could be prohibited. Provides specific setbacks and separation distances, particularly for residential uses. And so that we look and say, okay, our residential areas are where people live. We would like to make sure that we're protecting them. It supports existing property owners and communities and their concerns. Minimizes regulatory, regulatory authority outside the corridors. Again, open use. If it's there, can continue and pretty much can continue as is. Option two continued with the cons. Public perception may be negative. This is zoning, and it's essentially an extension of an existing zoning ordinance outside of Pisgah Forest community. And, and just as an aside, Transylvania County was able to adopt the Pisgah Forest community zoning ordinance through the regulations that allow a county or community to have zoning as long as two requirements are met. You have to have 640 acres, and you have to have 10 or more parcels. And there were enough people in that area, in the Pisgah Forest community, that wanted to see something done and wanted the county commissioners to act on their behalf that we were able to do that. Um, option two does not address areas outside the designated corridors, really. Again, open use. It will require more staff support over long term. If you have changes, if you have somebody that wants to put in a new business or change the facade or a business that is already existing on the corridor, that would mean that there would be a review process. Implementation timeline, I think staff looks at this because it's already existing. Uh, you, we would want to go out to the community. We would try to build support from this, try to address the concerns that people outside Pisgah Forest might have. We might even try to ask people from the Pisgah Forest community to meet with others to say this is how they have seen this ordinance work. But we think that it would probably take three to six months. And I think that that fits within the time frame that county commissioners have said that we have to address the issue of that moratorium. And what do we do beyond that? As I've said, staff review updates, county commissioners review, stakeholder approval, public meetings, and ultimately you as a board, county commissioners, at least one probably would opt for multiple public hearings just to make sure that the community was aware of this. This next slide, um, commissioners have in their workbook, but it, it, from the distance, it, it just looks like the outline of the county, but essentially, in your mind, if you can, from the center line of 276, US 64, NC 280, probably old 64, 215, whatever roads the community and ultimately county commissioners wanted to address, we could then identify what that buffer would be. 500 feet from the center line, 1,000 foot from the center line, and that could be your corridor use. Yes, ma'am. Mark, if you don't mind, just because I, I think I figured it out, but not being one who lives, sleeps, eats, and breathes this stuff, do you mind pointing out the You've referenced the corridors earlier, but this is not labeled. Can you just show folks what you're talking about here, please? We're going to try to get a laser mark. <clears throat> we think we have that. I think I can. I mean, I know it's simple for, sure. for a lot of folks, but I'm just not used to seeing the county from above with little black lines all over it. Commissioner Lamell has asked that 
I try to identify some of the major corridors graphically for everybody. Well, I'm just looking for the ones that you're speaking you yeah. specifically addressed as potentially being Carter mixed sure. use zones. Sure. You just highlight those, please. And, and commissioners have this in their books. We have a larger map up on the table here that better shows it. Uh, I think. The ones that staff would be looking at initially would be 280 coming in from Mills River, Henderson County. 64 would certainly be one from Henderson County all the way probably to Jackson County. But it doesn't have to be. You could end it at some point because the topography is such that you might get to Silverstein Road and just say, we really just don't see a whole lot more that's going to happen. But right now, staff is just saying all of 64. Uh, 276 is probably one certainly within a commute of the town, maybe out further, would be one that you would want to look at. 276 going up in the forest, we wouldn't have to worry with, obviously, because it's already in force. Um, 178 dropping down into South Carolina would probably be another. Depending on feedback from public and from the different communities, we may look at corridors and expand that definition. Some people might want to say we need to look at Crab Creek Road as a potential as a corridor. But the ones that we've identified would be the U.S. highways and the North Carolina 280 as well as, um, well, I guess 178 is U.S. 178. Mm -hmm. But you've got on here not only 28064, but also it looks to me that you're talking about old 64 as well. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Old 64 is highlighted right. on the map right here as well. Okay, and 215 seemingly? 215 is. It's got something, some color on it. it it's got a green. Yeah, it's got green, so it is highlighted, although there are parts of it up here and in here where it's primarily going through national forest that there would be no reason to do that. Yeah. Right, thank, thank you. you. Mark, <coughs> question. Any, yes, sir. So, yeah. When you talk about this setback, you say, you know, 500 feet from the center line or what, does that, is that an exclusive exclusion area? that you're talking about when you talk about setbacks from the center, you know, what exactly does that mean? Well, it would be much like we have in the Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance right now. And we have, from the center line, we set back a certain distance. And what we do is, if a piece of property touches on it, then that entire property is included within the mixed-use corridor. And so there is a, I guess, a higher level of restriction that takes place along that corridor. And so when the issue of, um, let's say, a, a, a vacant piece of property comes up for sale and somebody wants to put in a new business there, the ordinance limits, the ordinance limits the number of road cuts that can be placed on that. Again, that's more for traffic and safety purposes. But it is a more restrictive area than areas outside of the corridor use district. Other questions? Good, thank you. Option three, and, and I think I mentioned this at the beginning, but I want to, to repeat this again. Option two is zoning. Uh, there's, there's no way of getting around that. Option three is not zoning. It is a ordinance that is based on different statutes that the General Assembly allows counties and municipalities to adopt. Oh, there are many different ordinances that would be in play here under one, many different statutes that would be used for this. So it's not zoning. And somebody might say, well, why would this be number three? It's an ordinance rather than zoning. And the reason why a staff has looked at this and said, in terms of time to address and try to create a draft for commissioners, the sequencing would be option one requires very little time, no time. Option four requires the most amount of time. And then option two, three, and that's how it's sequenced. So option three is to modify the draft high impact land uses ordinance that county commissioners and a number of citizens in our community have helped put together uh, as a draft, which one? 
I want to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I can learn. Um, the, the point simply being on this that we would, in terms of high impact land use ordinance, we've had community members, we've had county commissioners, we've had staff look at, and we have a draft to work from. There have been other drafts that have been circulated that have some additional work that's been done. Staff has looked at and has provided some additional feedback to the county commissioners and the copies that they have with some suggested ideas of changes that we might suggest. The reality is that we would very much want to go out to the community. We would want to work with groups like the EDAB, Economic Development Advisory Board. We have some members here tonight with a planning board and others to try to help craft something that actually could make sense if this was something that you as a board wanted. Pros. Avoids the use of zoning. It regulates high impact slash polluting uses based on separation distances, not zones or districts. So basically what you say is, if you want to put this type of use, let's say it is a biomass facility, why? Um, you have to be able to cite that on a piece of property that at the edge of that use, you have a minimum of 2,500 feet or 4,000 feet. You set some criteria that says that it's far enough away from adjoining property owners that they would be okay or at least comfortable knowing it's in that area because it would not have immediate impact on. You also look at such things as noise, you look at traffic conditions, and you try to incorporate all that into a high impact land uses ordinance. Other North Carolina counties have used similar regulations with limited to no negative effect on economic development as we understand. And legal challenges to similar ordinances have been upheld. Uh, I mean, this is an important thing for the community con to consider. Um, I have, as has the county manager, already Wilson and I have had to deal with lawsuits on economic development issues where we were out in front. And knowing that courts have upheld something does make a difference. And there is a template for ordinance and minimizing staff time. The cons. From staff's perspective, this is a patchwork solution to broader land use issues and concerns. It really, it addresses only by distance and separation um, some of the bigger issues that our community, our county is dealing with and will only have to deal with more frequently as we become a denser county uh, and as we see different types of uses being proposed. Obviously, based on the draft that was presented, a number of people see this, and I think rightly so, as being business unfriendly. So how do you craft something then that is business friendly? We need rock quarries. This county, if it's going to grow, if we want to have development, if we want to see economic development and the ability to provide jobs for future generations, we have to have certain fundamental pieces to our economy. Rock quarries being a great example. I would even say asphalt plants are probably something that we have to have here. So where do you put them? And so the cons here is that we really don't, we're not addressing the bigger issue of how do we get in 15 or 20 years address planning and economic development. Implementation timeline is probably very similar to option two, three to six months. Again three to six months based on the fact that we have a draft, that there's been something that has up, been upheld in courts. Uh, but staff would want on behalf of commissioners to take this out to the community, have public meetings, solicit input from business owners, and try to craft something that made sense for Transylvania County. Option four. Open use or other, and it's really we're talking about something that would be other in this case because option uh, two, the Pisgah Force zoning ordinance is really an open use. 
uh, zoning ordinance. So we're talking about something that is going to be more like and in the notebooks prepared for the county commissioners, Madison County has a zoning ordinance. It's fairly simple. Uh, in fact, it's very simple. Um, it may not be exactly what Transylvania County would want to look at, but it's an example of a mountain county that has said we'd like to proactively look at land use issues and development. And so it's placed in the commissioner's booklets as only an example of something to look towards. Uh, pros of countywide zoning, and this is staff's thoughts on this. Proactively addresses address current and future land use concerns on a countywide basis. Regulates new high impact uses through separation distances and setbacks based on zones or districts. Let me explain that. There are certain areas in our community that we know, for example, are ideal for agriculture. And in fact, the planning board a number of years ago recommended to the county commissioners and the county commissioners adopted a farmland district ordinance, which basically identifies areas in Transylvania County to protect farmers from nuisance lawsuits. It, it is something of a, a better explanation. With a farmland use district, the farmer who is in that district is protected from nuisance lawsuits from a new property owner that doesn't like flies that might be associated with cattle when their cattle are close to the property line or the smell of cattle. And so it is a way of protecting that area from other people complaining and possibly even putting forth a nuisance lawsuit. There are other areas in the county that the planning board and economic development advisory board have looked and said, we know that because of the topography, because of the relative location of roads, and because of water and sewer and natural gas, there are some areas in this county that are probably better suited for future economic development. And we do not have a tremendous amount of that. So maybe we would want to try to identify those areas within a zoning ordinance that protects that area. And it says we value this area because we have the potential for manufacturing. Now, what type of manufacturing is another discussion that Economic Development Advisory Board county commissioners have. And that's a whole different process. But at least you preserve an area that might be worthy of that. And that really is the third point, and uh, the bullet there is much more succinct. Provides opportunities for countywide planning. And the last one may not make sense intuitively, but we know from discussions with the city of Bavard that they are very concerned about the extension of water and sewer to different areas of the community unless there's some way to protect that resource. Water is an extremely valuable resource. Wastewater is also a valuable resource. And just because a community or a business wants to have water and sewer does not necessarily mean that it's in the best interest of the community, the city, or even the county to extend it and not be able to preserve the best use of that water and sewer. And so that's what that last bullet stands for. The cons. Community-wide support may be lacking. Uh, I know many of my friends, a number of businesses and colleagues uh, that live in this community, in the county, look at this and say, no, this is really about property rights, and we want to protect that property right that we have on the land that we own. And that is definitely a concern that I think that commissioners would have to look to and say, how do you address this in the development of this? And that's a, that would be a task, a hard task, for staff and other groups that would be working on this to try to figure out how do we make this work if we could. Um, staff time could be significant. There's no doubt about that. Uh, this is something that is, uh, it would be a major change for our community. Uh, public meetings required, public meetings would be required for the other ones too, and that's, that really shouldn't even be a con. I, I think the 
optimistic time period on this would be one to one and a half years. That would be optimistic. And I think that that would be with you as a Board of County Commissioners going out and charging staff and other groups to say, we really like to look at this in a very comprehensive way to make sense for not only us now, but looking into the future 10, 15, 20 years. There would be extensive public engagement with this. So with that, I um, was asked to try to keep comments down to roughly uh, 30 minutes, and with the pushing of the wrong button, managed to extend it another five, 10 minutes. But I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. I know you've got a lot of information in front of you. The one thing that I would point out is that the drafts that you have, as I look at Commissioner Lamell's color highlights and all the tabs that she has, <laughs> is that this is just the beginning point for discussion and that we may not have answers tonight, but it will allow staff to be able to come back and try to address concerns that you might have. Mark, what, what was the thinking when you made the statement that option three would be less business friendly than, say, option two? Depending on how you structure it, um, to me, option three sets doesn't have districts. It doesn't define a zone or a district. What it does is it uh, defines setbacks for different types of uses. And the initial draft that we looked at had something on the order of 2,000 plus feet for a business identified as one that you would not want, a high impact use. Well, basically just round numbers. If you took a half mile and you said that you had to be a half mile, your property, you had to be in the center of a piece of property that was a half mile radius around you, you are now looking at having to have a piece of property that's 640 acres before you could site one of those businesses, just rough numbers. To me, that's much more onerous and would not allow for the business friendly component of it. But it could be, you could redefine by distance and you could also say certain uses could also be changed. Well, in option two, how, do, how would you address high impact businesses with option two? I think with the impact of how would you address the impact of high uses that could have a significant impact on the community. Staff working with community, working with other groups would be trying to define what are those high impact uses and do you want to, as I identified, specifically exclude them from that corridor, mixed use, or would you say we will allow, but we will allow only upon the condition of, and that's where your planning board and your board of adjustment would come back in and have the ability to say we will allow, but you will have to have certain times of operation, you'll have to have certain lighting restrictions, uh, and so you begin to put criteria around it that allows the business to operate, but in a way that would be more conducive to the community. So basically you'd establish a high impact ordinance for that corridor. Is that what, kind of what you're saying? Yes, sir. Yes. Mark, help me understand the de definition of a, the PUD, the PUDs, because I couldn't tell if that pertained, I mean, it seemed to be commercial, residential, it seemed to be a little bit of everything, and I really wasn't clear on how that all fit into things. Which page are you on, please? Uh, I think I you're... I am on page 10 of 48 in section 2. Because you've got more than two principal buildings or uses, uses proposed to be constructed on a single lot, any building with a gross floor of 30,000 square feet or more, and then residential complex of five. It just seemed to be a little bit of everything, and I was trying to get my head around that. So this is the Pisgah Forest Zoning Ordinance that Commissioner Lamella is referring to. 
And basically what you're looking at here is if you have a development that's going to be fairly large okay. and that you begin, you actually are going to negotiate with the planning board how that's going to develop. All and so property. it's a planned unit development where you're working with the planning board, with staff, to try to figure out how does it fit on that piece of property. Okay. And so here you're looking at with a you know, you're looking at a building that's over 35,000 square feet. And that, that would be a critical piece here. So that's a requirement before you hit. In, in uh, this case, we were saying any building with a gross square foot floor of 35,000. So it okay, was. Okay, so it, I wasn't reading it correctly. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Good. No. That's fine. Okay. And, and I guess I was curious too, I had some extensive, extensive conversations regarding sawmills earlier this summer. That's true. And it was, I found it a little interesting to me that in Section 2, you defined a sawmill as operation employing 10 or more full-time employees, but then when you got to the high-impact land use three. ordinance, you dropped down to three. Yeah. So are we, would I, I we think be, as we develop some of these conversations, would, be, would, be, would we be looking at trying to be more consistent at, at what we're asking? Well, remember, or, you've got two very different ordinances well, I that we're, we're different, but but. Commissioner Chapman just got you to say that we're actually going to be imposing a high use land, high impact land use right. ordinance within a CMZ or CMX if that's the way we go in number two. Right. So, so I think the answer would be, and staff, is, we've already identified that. Yeah. If okay. we could come back to that, okay. we would have already made that change sure. so that it was 10 in both cases and not three. Three is just a very small number for right. business. And I, again, we're looking at how do you make this business friendly? And so that's, that's what we were looking at. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, and I guess, you know, I was so interested in the Madison County thing because it did indeed seem so simple. And, when, and I guess I felt like I got down in the weeds with the high impact land use ordinance and specifically with setbacks. I mean, I'm looking, you know, just thinking in terms of vegetative buffers and everything else, I'm kind of wondering how much land do you have left when you do all this stuff? That's a real question. Okay, good. I mean, that becomes a, that is probably a central part of the high impact land uses ordinance is, you know, can you actually cite something or are you de facto saying we don't want it and, and we're not going to say that, but we're going to just simply put a distance there and you, you would not be able, as I used an example, if you had uh, a half mile distance separation, mm -hmm. you literally would have to have essentially a piece of property that's 640 acres and be able to site that facility right in the center of it. And, and there's not many 648 acre parcels in this county. Well, and, and being the control freak that I tend to be, is it really I, really that people operate under these buffer specificity of how many different sizes b of bushes that you have that you're required to put in these things? I mean, is this serious? Um, I think that that goes to the issue that we've had in the discussion of being business friendly. Okay. Yeah. More talk? Talking about... Uh, this topic about the buffer topic and putting it in relation with the purpose of the moratorium one of the things we said or the moratorium says uh, it's the, the, it speaks of uh, and I'm quoting providing time for the development consideration implementation of potential county regulations to address the impacts of these facilities on the county this buffer you know the buffer numbers uh, there's no data to support in other words, when I read that, I say, well, there is a particular high impact use that, that has a particular uh, consequence, negative consequence, environmental consequence, noise consequence, whatever. And that's the reason for these buffers. And, and so how do we find data to be able to, to make these buffers, if we choose to go in that direction, make those buffers make any kind of logical sense? That's a good question, and Chris and I have spent a fair amount of time discussing that and trying to identify other ordinances, looking at what other communities that have similar ordinances have done in terms of defining what that buffer is, what that setback would be. And I think that's part of that uh, probably three to six month period 
a review is trying to identify what is the rationale for that distance uh, and including vegetative buffers. You know, what's the rationale? Um, we have ordinances already on the books, the telecommunication tower ordinance that says that you will screen the base uh, area where it's fenced in and you'll screen that with vegetative cover and that's so that people driving by don't just see the mass of you know the workings of a telecommunication tower. That's a, an aesthetic issue. Is that how, how important is that for this community relative to knowing that there's not going to be a use that could perhaps have environmental concerns um, and uh, on the environmental piece, you know, I think we have to rely on the state to make sure that whatever happens is going to meet state requirements. But beyond that, our citizens have asked you as a board to say, how do we protect ourselves? And I think staff would really have to be looking at that and probably there would have to be a lot more discussions uh, amongst staff and other entities um, trying to figure out what a good setback is, what those buffers are. Um, the draft that we received had buffers that were extremely large. And I think that if I was a business owner or somebody that was interested in looking at a business, I think I could have looked very easily at those buffers and said, this is fine. We just don't need it or want any more types of business here. And I think that that was the reason why there was the negative reaction in some part uh, to the initial draft. And so we. That's going to be a challenge, Commissioner Hawkins, trying to figure out what is the, the rationale that makes sense for Transylvania County. Since our uh, citizens don't have uh, access to the information that we do, uh, in looking at the high impact, uh, again, these are what's in the draft here, certainly uh, are not written in stone, can be modified, added to, dropped, or whatever. But just to uh, provide our citizens with a list of at least what's on the table right now or things that are considered is high impact use. I'd like to just run down the list r fairly quickly. Asphalt plants, bulk and flammables, chemicals, explosive manufactured or storage facilities, chip mills or wood grinding operations, commercial incinerators, concrete plants, electric generating facilities, junkyards, medical waste facilities, mining and extraction operations and quarries, motorsports activities, sawmills, slaughter and processing plants, and solid waste management facilities. So that, that's a fairly extensive list, but they also, I, I think, anybody could argue that these are high impact business in a community like ours. But I'd also like to make another comment. Uh, we've had presentations over the past few months. Uh, we already know that probably two-thirds or 63 percent or, or more of this county is basically already zoned, whether it be national forest, state forest, our residential areas, our cities, our floodplain uh, with the river. So, you know, I think we got enough, quote, zoning. I think at least what I uh, am looking at, and, and again, this is, you know, we're just looking at things here. I, I don't see any need, at least, of spending time or what on a, quote, countywide zoning. Because I think, I think we have enough of that based on just a, and, you know, and you look at the corridors, they're so limited area that we have now anyway. <laughs> and, uh, but that's just, uh, Mr. Chairman, just a thought of mine. I know this is not a decision meeting, but we also need to be moving forward and not taking, waiting another however many months to decide what kind of direction we want to give staff to at least come back Sure. with the next next round of information but sure. uh, that's uh, just a point here that we are two-thirds zoned already if i can add to that comment and the one that you also made when you identify the uses for high impact um, it sounds like a fairly extensive list but in my experience as planning director and talking to other planners and economic developers in the region and across the state as soon as you identify that list, somebody will come up with something that's going to be a high impact use that you didn't think about. And so that's something that, that maybe there is a way of putting a catch all uh, that allows for further review by uh, planning board, 
Board of Adjustment or commissioners. And then in terms of um, existing zoning in the county, uh, you're absolutely correct. 54% of Transylvania County is either in federal or state holding. Uh, we know that 5% is in floodplain. Um, we estimate that approximately, Chris help me with this, but approximately 20% is already zoned residential with restrictive covenants that have been adopted uh, by homeowners associations. And so, um, and then you look at the city of Bavard as a geographical area that already has zoning. So there's not uh, a lot of the county that has not been zoned in some fashion. So. I think it's also important, one last comment, that, you know, I don't look at this as anything we're discussing here to prohibit anything as far as going out and say this cannot happen in this community. Yes, it can happen, but here may be some guidelines that you've got to adhere to. Now, I understand you can make those where it's cost prohibitive, you might as well say it's prohibited, but uh, I don't in view any of these that we're looking at, whether we come up the list of five or 10 or, or 25, if we go that direction, is going out there and stating these are prohibited. We just want to be able to manage them as best uh, in the impact, reduce it as much as we can. And I think that that's uh, defined with community meetings and seeking input from the community. There may be some uses that the community and you as a board, as I mentioned, that's already in the Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance. There may be some uses that you just say, we don't want them. They're not who we are, and, and you already identify those. But in general, I agree with you, sir, and that what we're trying to do is put side bounds or binders so that something can come in, hopefully, that would be beneficial to the community, increase tax base, hopefully provide opportunity for people to work, but do it in a way that is consistent with what the community, what Transylvania County would like to see. Thank you. Tagging on a little bit to what Larry's discussing with you, you know, knowing that we were making some of these things less attractive uh, than others potentially, and knowing the importance of the role of, of variance in something like this to be able to work with entities that that we want to work with i'd like to understand the overall process a little bit better if i could because there were reference many references i felt to a zoning administrator and i found myself reading that as the czar basically of the whole process so i kind of wanted to know that what that looks like what does the zoning administrator look like and then for instance in where am I? I'm in the Pisgah Forest section right now on page 46. There's reference to submitting an application for a zoning permit to the county commissioner. So I was like, gee, I, I mean, I didn't realize we, I didn't know if we were actually in the business of issuing permits. I thought that would be done on an administrative Staff. level. It's administrative. Okay. It's administrative. So, it, so I was just reading through this, trying to envision, okay, we have this entity that comes to the county. What's, what's the process that they go through? And then with the high impact land use ordinance, yeah. it seems to be fairly clear on page 15 there that there's a board of adjustment, which I think I saw at some point was equated with the planning board, mm -hmm. and then a, an appeal beyond that would then come to us, and then if we didn't behave, then it goes on to superior court, I guess. Yeah, cool. so, yeah. so I just wanted to understand the, the sort of the vision of this zoning administrator, how this process of variance would come forward, what our role as a board would be in that. Um, and then I do have a second question. Do you want me to do that? But it's off Let me, and My mind is already on, yeah. on, right, on take, the take czar you're and the czar. Okay. I, I deal with the czar. So okay. um, well, you, know, you, I, as, I like you as a board get to get to a point, whoever that czar is. Okay. And so uh, I, I get to push that back to the Board fine. of County Commissioners. Um, so basically, it's an administrator. Okay. Uh, you're going to have somebody that will be identified at staff level. And, and you're going to have this whether it is, you may call the person a different title. If it's zoning, it's going to be a zoning administrator. If it's a high impact uh, land uses ordinance, it will just be an administrator. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be an individual that is going to be working with the property owner or the business that is wanting to acquire property and put something there and work with them through a process to say, okay, here are the regulations. Help us understand what type of business you have, what are your plans, here's how 
Transylvania County is viewing this. This, are, this would be, again, regardless if it's an ordinance or zoning, staff would work them through the process, much as we do with our existing ordinances right now. So on an existing ordinance, subdivision control. Somebody comes in and wants to, uh, Mountain Falls, good example, wanted to develop 84 acres. What do they do? They come in and they talk to a staff person and say, okay, what are the requirements? Have they changed since we were here last? How do we go through this process? Uh, telecommunication tower ordinance, same thing. We've had a couple of different towers that have requested, businesses that have requested new towers. You meet with the person that's enforcing that ordinance and understand what the regulations are and how to move through that. The goal being how to move them through the process in a timely and business friendly way. That to me is the critical piece and I, I would say in, in, with the public here, that's been the mandate from the county manager, which right. is mandate from you as a board, which is we want to make sure that we are seen and are business friendly in the way we try to address issues. Now on the issue of variances, all right, so let's say I'm, going to, I'm simplifying That's using fine. the tower ordinance that you just recently right. looked at. Mm -hmm. So the owner wanted to build on, add on to an existing tower, but the way the ordinance is currently worded, it would take the height of the tower beyond the fall radius that's allowed. Sure. Planning board looked at it and they said, you know what, the way engineering designs are today, we really don't need to have the fall radius equal the height of the tower. It will close in or crash upon itself. And so a variance was recommended. The applicant asked for a variance, worked with staff to make sure that wording was proper on that and then came to you, well, came to the planning board. Planning board denied because that's the way the ordinance was written, is written, but then a recommendation to you as a board to approve. So a variance is really dealing with an exception because of the language of the ordinance. Uh, one of the things that I've learned in my history as planning director is if you issue or have too many variances over a period of time, you need to rewrite your, your ordinance. ordinance. Sure. Because it's no longer, it's not valid. Something's changed. And in fact, with the tower ordinance, that's what the planning board has been working on, is how do you update that? Mm -hmm. So a variance then is the applicant looking for a way to meet approval. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I understand what a variance is. I was just interested in how it all played out. And, and I, I've oversimplified probably. And that's fine, okay. that's okay. Next question. All right, talk to me about the high impact land use ordinance and the, the burden or potential burden, I guess I should say, the potential burden on existing businesses that we value here in our community who are deemed non-conforming if we adopt a high impact land use ordinance and then our wonderful existing business that we value so much goes to expand. And I had a little trouble with some of the language bouncing back and forth, getting my head around yeah. it. it. I mean, it seemed that the intention was that these non-conforming businesses would be allowed to expand two times. Two times to a certain size. size. And right. that size is right now as a percentage of their existing area. But I think that staff would want to go back, uh, Commissioner Lamel, and really work with, because we've not had discussions with some of those businesses and say, does this as an example make sense to you? I mean, right. two times, maybe, maybe one, maybe three times, maybe we say that you're allowed to grow to a certain, maybe more than 20%, but this was a way of trying to address, initially address the issue of being business friendly for existing businesses. Right. And I, I think I, that was in large part listening to several of commissioners and to EDAB members and some of the owners. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, yes, I can speak to one industry in particular. It's very concerned about this. I was just, I guess I got lost again in the weeds, which is easy for me to do in all of this stuff, um, is to the extent that the degree of nonconformity is not increased. And I'm thinking, okay, how do you increase the size of something? And the nonconformity, you know, it's just like you're producing more, so how's your nonconformity not increased? I don't, you know, semantics. I'm a concrete thinker, Mark. You got to help me here. Well, you are helping us right now. If this is a direction that you as a board want us to go towards, we understand that we're going to have to come back and make sure that this is something that we can come back and really have, have some better.
clear ways of addressing this with support from the business community. Okay. So the feedback is very helpful. Not really a question, question more comments, I guess. I have some concerns with some of the initial baselines that we're establishing, for lack of a better term. For instance, with option one, we talked about under pros and cons, fails to proactively enhance economic development. That's really an opinion of staff. I mean, there are, you've had speakers come in that says, well, you need more zoning to increase economic development. I could call up speakers to come in and say, you want to increase economic development, make sure you're not hindering my potential. So, I mean, that's, I mean, to say that as a matter of fact bothers me a little bit. Option three under modifying the existing draft high impact other North Carolina counties have used similar regulations with limited to no negative impact or negative effect on economic development. But just a few minutes ago, we're talking about how, well, some of those other, or other ones would be too restrictive. So, I mean, I think that would hinder economic development. That in itself counteracts that statement on as a pro. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about having a preset opinion of what we want to go and not laying out all the information appropriately and, and and that's my personal opinion. I mean, no, I no one's going to be no. surprised. Completely understand where I'm coming from. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have great concerns, and I appreciate Paige mentioning some of those specific examples about expansion in those, those activities. I, I have some major concerns if that's if that's the pathway that we went. I would encourage commissioners to look strongly at that because if I'm a business owner, I'm looking to expand. And, and I'm being told well, I can only expand 20%, 15%, one or two times, but I can go down the road somewhere and I can expand all I want. That, that is a very big decision as a business owner I would have to make. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't think that's helping economic development. I mean, if that's the parameters that we're putting. So I, I would encourage commissioners to look strongly in those areas. Thank you. Yeah, and again, without getting too much into the weeds, but Jason's right, and, and you might you might say there's you might add a, a, a variance process to that as well after a second expansion that they could they might be they might be denied, but then they might uh, might appeal to a board of adjustment. I think that would be a, a, a certainty in that situation. Yeah. Mark, to hit on something that uh, Jason mentioned. Uh, in regards to uh, there being no impact in economic development in the communities where high impact land use ordinance have been uh, enacted, can we, we get some hard data to prove that, or is that just a? Uh, I think that's going to be more subjective. I think, I think it's going to be. I, I think it's a very valid point uh, that is that, that's been made. I, I think that how do you measure that? Uh, the anecdotal. The discussions that we've had uh, and understanding from other communities is that no, it's not. Uh, but I do not have firm, hard data for that. And the other thing that <clears throat> the other thing I would like to add is: um, Have we considered performance-based ordinance? Uh, performance-based yes. zoning. <clears throat> that's typically what would be, and I mean that's. And well, what I, what I would what I have in mind, what I'm thinking, is that um, in in lieu of the setbacks here that we have, and the separation distance, things of that nature, that we have uh, in a high impact land use ordinance or uh, some sort of document, some sort of regulation that says, if a uh, business is coming in of this nature, this is what we're going to expect from you as it pertains to pollution mitigation, noise mitigation, traffic, things of that nature, and it's up to them. Uh, we're not necessarily enforcing a setback, um, but it's up to them in order to achieve that. We will be monitoring that, following up with it, but it's up to the business uh, in order to to provide that via their performance. Yeah. I, I think I understand the question that you're asking, which is uh, you, you don't want to prescribe yes. how they get to uh, the standard, exactly. but you identify this is what we expect. And this is what we'll be enforcing. And, and I think that as I would be looking at any final draft on however you were looking at this, um, I would not want to have something that is prescriptive 
other than perhaps setbacks, whatever that distance is, because I, I mean, you, that's something that you can't, but um, in terms of environmental, uh, my concern on that and something that staff will need some direction on is how much further do you go beyond what is required by North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources? Uh, and, and that's something that is a, a challenge to me. I, that, in terms of quantitative, you know, how could we justify something that's even more restrictive than what the state has? And so, in terms of prescriptive, um, the intention would be uh, on that, Commissioner Hogsett, would be to look and say, we're not going to try to tell them how to do it, but this is what is required. That's what we have with the tower ordinance, that's what we have with the subdivision ordinance. These are the standards. You, how you do this really doesn't matter as long as you meet the requirements. So I think we, we're trying to address that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mark, I know you're not a lawyer. We've got one sitting over here at the end of the table that maybe can address this. Uh, say we decided we didn't, we didn't want an asphalt plant. Did so not want an asphalt. So we didn't want asphalt or whatever it is. Okay. A helicopter sightseeing business. Asphalt's fine. Now that's in there. I don't know. You know, can we vote 5-0 or whatever? We don't want that. Is that legal? Not the way it currently is. shouldn't be. Um, I'm would, assuming it's not, but I want to ask to at least get it on the table. I mean, that, that, wasn't, that our, wasn't that our problem with the biomass plant? Yes. I mean, that's because that's right now, you, that's, you, that was what You cannot we, just, except for certain uses, and really the Pisgah Forest Zoning Ordinance where it identifies specific uses yeah, that can't I, be. That's what brought the question. Well, but the reason why you can do it in that limited area is because there's the entire rest of the county that you could theoretically put an adult entertainment establishment. And so we didn't prohibit it from being allowed in Transylvania County, only in that one zone. And that's, that's the difference with setbacks. That's what raised the question when I saw it there. It yes, sir. Did I do that right, sir? You did. Thank you. Is that correct, Counselor? It is. Now, hypothetically speaking, if we choose to do absolutely nothing, hmm? small area community planning could still take place, couldn't it, if 10 separate landowners and 640 acres come to us and, and want zoning they could have that happen yes. if we choose to same do as nothing. pisgah force community it okay. was a community that came to us we identified 640 plus acres right. 10 property owners and uh, we have building um, permits and we have a subdivision ordinance those are also the requirements that you have to have those and are enforcing those but the answer is and for those in the the back that if you didn't hear could if the county hypothetically didn't do anything, just allow the moratorium to expire, could smaller communities, jurisdictions, appeal to county commissioners to be zoned? That's what you're asking, then. It's because it's going to be a zoned area. And the answer would be yes. Mark, in your, <clears throat> your experience, speak to, you know, you always hear a lot of negative comments regarding, quote, spot zoning. And that's exactly, I guess, what the question is here. Your experience, what are the negative from a county government, county perspective on spot zoning? Does it create a lot of potential problems down the road? Uh, there's, there's two things here. And, and I'm, because I really, we have not dealt with zoning issues, I probably am not the best person to speak to this at this point without having done a lot more work on it. But there's two things here. Spot zoning is actually not legal. You cannot just spot zone. City of Bavard cannot look at a piece of property and say, we don't want anything here. Uh, and so that's, that's truly spot zoning. But I think if, if I understand your question correctly, you're asking, is it feasible, can you allow communities yeah. to yeah. have zoning? Is that zoning? a definition of spot zoning, what Commissioner LaMail just mentioned. Yeah, it's really, you wouldn't call it spot zoning. You would call it small jurisdiction zoning. You would call it community zoning. And then you would define what the areas are that you would like to have. Pisgah Forest, corridor mixed use, open use. Those are the two zones. Um, if it was Little River, for example, that you had a group of citizens that had more than 640 acres, 10 property owners, the county already has a subdivision ordinance. We enforce building code. 
they come to us and they say, we would like to have zoning. We would like these things to take place. We'd like to protect agriculture. We'd like to have a mixed corridor use, much like Pisgah Forest, and we'd like to have an open use. You could do that. That's legal. Um, the challenge to that would be over a period of time, the county then is now in, could be enforcing multiple jurisdictions, lots of different zoning ordinances. Buncombe County had that for many years. Buncombe County had zoning by township, which was, is another way of defining community. Uh, and it was difficult because it varied from township or zoning district to zoning district. But did I answer your question? Yeah, that's okay. pretty much. I guess the other question that kind of follow up to that, I assume we have some latitude to do quite a few things, but, you know, could we establish, okay, say we would allow that community type zoning, but it would all say it would read the same as, for example, the Pisgah Forest zoning, where you would not have an individual, each individual zone would have something totally different. Hmm. We could establish that you know, okay, if you want to do that community, here is what the guidelines are. So the citizen could look at that and say, okay, am I for this or against it? And this is what it would be that not each individual community is going to write their own zoning requirement. You could do that. You, you, you would have the authority to do that. Um, the question would be, is that meeting the needs of the citizens in that right. community? But if you wanted for sake of consistency, for ease of enforcement, uh, and cost effectiveness, you just say, here's a model. If you like it, we'll be glad to, if you can get 640 plus acres, 10 property owners, we would be glad to uh, consider that and uh, that establish area. Establish the boundary. Y'all. And establish a boundary. And, and here it is. You know, we're not going to change it. Um, I think the challenge on that simply would be um, each community, it, it, I don't know how we could write something that could address all of the different communities, so it wouldn't necessarily be uh, the best fit. But you could. But as with anything, you can modify it. Absolutely. Yes, sir. And once a zone like that exists, can then ancillary or, or contiguous property owners come into that fairly yes. easily? Yes. Yeah, well, you, you, the, you have to have, at the beginning, you have to have a minimum of 640 okay. acres. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't start with 500 acres. You start with 640, and you can add to that. So you could add to it. But again, Mark, going back to the purpose of the moratorium, that would not necessarily uh, prevent a problem like that from occurring again if you had that kind of... Uh, patchwork kind of self self uh, self desired yeah. land use plan absolutely because if if there was um, a piece of property just outside of <laughs> that community's owned area uh, and the property owner just basically said i don't want to be a part of this uh, and is willing to sell or would like to construct one of these uses um, there's nothing that would prohibit them from doing that in that situation. The other concern that I would have, if um, the option two from a time standpoint, if we were basically just to expand that to the corridors and, and look at that, fairly simple. Um, if we do it, if it's just the same option, but you allow other communities just to define, self-define, and then you would vote on that after public hearings and going through that process, uh, probably would take longer uh, than the time that we have for the moratorium to expire. That would be a concern that I would have uh, going that route. And again, it's, I, I guess the bigger concern for me is that it's not looking at the whole county in a holistic way. And, and I, I, your point is absolutely spot on about how much of the county is already under some form of control. But there are enough areas outside that are so important to who we are and how visitors see us and how we define ourselves that it seems to me we need to look at it at least holistically or at least approach it from that standpoint. Yeah, I think I think you could make the argument that that and, and Larry's absolutely right with his in the statistics that you gave about 
the amount of land that is already in the county that has these restrictions of one sort or another, but I think a, a reasonable argument could be made that instead of arguing against looking at land use planning, that in fact argues that it's even more important to take a look at land use planning on the remainder property because there it could theoretically be that pressure. And theoretically is the word here because I, I think that's the other point that needs to be made that we talk about these potential pressures and they're just potential pressures right now that, you know, are, are, are these potential adverse, except for the one specific example, which is it's not caused that it's, the, the moratorium is not designed uh, because of uh, of that potential, the Penrose situation, but it did come as a result of it. Definitely, there was a cause and effect there for that. Yeah. Mark Page was talking about being down in the weeds, that kind of, you know, Page is an engineer, and, and I'm not that kind of person. I'm more broad. I want to ask you a broad question. Okay. And and just in your opinion, your, what's, what's your definition of land use planning? What is land use planning? Um, it's when a community uh, collectively determines how it wants to see land identified, current use, and how they want to see that land developed in the future for, the, for that community over a period of time. And so it's, it's a definition that is going to be mercurial because it's developed by the community and ultimately adopted by the local jurisdiction. Um, so that's, that's a kind of a broad way of looking at land use. What is land use? I mean, you can go specifically and say this area is already primarily residential. And not only is it primarily residential, it also has mobile homes in it. So we'll call it our uh, residential uh, 1M. And so you've now included manufacturing. Or it's along a corridor and it's already got some businesses there. So it's a mixed business area. But it's defined by the community, and that's the importance of comprehensive planning and the importance of having within the comprehensive plan a land use map that identifies where things are spatially to other things, floodplain, national forest, existing residential development. Well, given that definition, the, the options that you're giving us, let's, let's just say option two and option three. Option two is the, you know, to, to modify the existing zoning ordinance uh, further out into the corridors, and option, option three is the high impact use ordinance. Mm -hmm. Is one of those options land use planning and another one not? The, Yes, uh, the Pisgah Forest Zoning Ordinance and extending that out really relies on land use. Okay. Whereas the High Impact Land Uses Ordinance is really an ordinance that's looking at separation. And you identify what you don't want or what that concern is, and that's what you're focusing on, rather than on what is existing and how you'd like to see that area develop. So yes, the uh, Pisgah Forest Community Zoning Ordinance would be based on land use planning and um, zoning and, and not the ordinance. Mr. Chairman, as we opened up the meeting here, I, I, uh, I do not want us to lose sight of probably the most important issue sitting here and that's the personal property rights of our Transylvania County citizens. Uh, I do feel that we need to continue this discussion, which I'm sure we will, but we do not lose sight of what we can do here that has the minimum impact on each individual property owner within this county. We've gone a hundred and however many years old this county is, and, and we've not had many of these issues. You know, when we start looking at what we're doing here, if another Acousta wanted to come in to Pisgah Forest down there, we'd probably have a heck of a time trying to figure out how to deal with that. So, you know, most of us here are natives and grew up here. We've been doing very well here, but times are changing. And the biomass plant sort of uh, raised that flag up to the top of the flagpole. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, for personal property rights, but unfortunately a lot of these industries that we talked about here, their impact doesn't stop at that property line. If it did, uh, I don't care what they did on that thing up to that property line. 
So it, then it becomes, it's not just a personal property right, it's impacting the people around it because that impact doesn't stop at the property line. So uh, I think we would be amiss to say that we're gonna do nothing. Again, my opinion here, uh, don't know, but we need to keep this discussion going, but do not, please do not lose sight of the personal property rights of the citizens of this community and how we can address the issues of these non-desirable, even though I think with certain requirements and restrictions, they can be desirable. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because your list in here says that they're non-desirable, you can take everything here and deal with some issue to make it probably fairly desirable, you know? And uh, so I don't wanna, but we also need to address the impact on adjacent property owners when the impact does not stop that property line. And I'm I, I add my support for what Larry was just saying. I, I think, you know, personally, for me, number one's off the table, and I think number four is off the table right now. And I think I'd like to see us focus our discussions on number two and number three <laughs> and explore um, the alternatives on both of those options. And I think, you know, it would mean referring things back to staff and to the planning board and others to see what we can come up with in, in both of those areas. But, but those are the two that seem very reasonable to me at this point. And I, and I agree too. I mean, both Larry and I spent a lot of time with, with the biomass issue earlier this spring. And it, they, I said frequently then, it was a shot across the bow. And I think it, I, I understand property rights. I stand very proudly on that which I own. Um, and I, I, you know, I've had many, many experiences feeling that I've lost control of my own property, being a member of the, ETJ where I don't get to vote and I don't pay taxes and have no say. So I, I, I understand that completely and totally. Mm -hmm. But I also know that, that times are changing and we do need to be prepared because we just can't continue to fight each battle individually. We've got to get ourselves organized. We've got to be prepared to address that which is coming our way. And if I understand the purpose of tonight's meeting, which is really just discussion, and to come back at a later date with instruction for staff on how to proceed with this, one thing, Commissioner Lamel, that I think you pointed out earlier is that if your instruction at a later date is to focus on options two and three, we would want to make sure that they are consistent in, for example, the sawmill, the number of employees. And so that's something that uh, staff could easily do on that. Mark, just a question. Um, yes, sir. Just wading in the weeds, as we've been saying. In the initial write-up with option two, you're talking about the corridors, and it wasn't mentioned 178, but when you put the, the map up and in your initial comments, you started discussing US 178, which would, I mean. I, yeah, I, I actually, I would, if I was to rewrite that memo, Commissioner Chapel, what I would do is put I period, E period as kind of examples, because I think that that's gonna ultimately be up to the community and then you as a board, if that's the direction you wanna go, which areas you would like to have that mixed corridor use area apply to. So the, the memo is more example of what could be. And so, yeah. And don't get confused, I didn't, I wasn't suggesting that's the way I wanna go. No, 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 I'm, I, and I, I understand. And, and I think the, the good thing, uh, and I think I mentioned this at the beginning, and we have until, you have, excuse me, until the end of uh, July to come up with an alternative to replace uh, the existing moratorium, if you so desire. From a staffing perspective, um, if the staff has already done, I guess, some broad strokes on this just internally, trying to identify for tonight's meeting and just having a discussion of, you know, how do you think this might work? What would you like to see? What are the concerns? Um, we would be able, if you came back at a meeting in early January, I think the timeline for either or both options two and three are doable, uh, allowing you as a board to have public hearings at the end of a process. Uh, and Artie and I have talked, you know, we also know that we've, you're in the midst of a budget process too. And so the, you'd have to be looking at that. But I think that we have the time and the flexibility 
to look at both of those uh, if at a later date you know you come back and say staff we'd like you to at least begin focusing on these Commissioners, any other questions or comments? Just appreciate your time tonight, Mark. You did a great job putting all this together. Thank you. It made for three nights worth of reading for me. <laughs> Just three. Just three. And, uh, we'll work on that for the next yeah, meeting. Dude, thanks. I know there's already, there's already been a comment made by Commissioner Lamell about our existing businesses. To me, that is as strong of an issue of anything we're dealing with to reduce or eliminate any negative impact on any of our current businesses and if we have to put in an asterisk in here exempting by name if that's legal again i have to refer to my uh, counselor down there on the end but i am absolutely totally against anything that's going to negatively impact any of our current businesses I'm, I'm certain that each of you because the county commissioners have adopted the economic development strategic plan but goal number one, and I enjoy saying this often and very loudly, goal number one of the county's economic development strategic plan is to assist our existing businesses. And I think that the county does a very good job of that and it would be the intent of staff to make sure that whatever you have, whichever option you ask staff to pursue ultimately will be just that. And that is actually a commitment that I've made to some of the people in this audience that actually have businesses in the community, so. Maybe I'm the only one sitting up here that option one's not off the, completely off the table. But if we were to move forward with uh, option number two, um, as far as I'm concerned, at primary, without any caveats, first and foremost, we protect property rights of business owners and as individuals. I have serious reservations about us telling a business um, or what's in, what's in the, the draft now of defining to a business how much they can expand. Um, that's, uh, to me, that's, that's not Transylvania County and that's not America. Uh, if we go to the extent that I believe that Commissioner Chapman was talking about of exempting um, existing businesses, that'd be fine with me. And one other thing I would point out is that um, we're in the process of, I think, you know, we pretty well know what those development corridors are. Um, we're in the process of identifying those and product development. Uh, we need to uh, make sure, I'm not saying that we're not, we just need to have the emphasis to make sure that we're doing this in tandem with the current studies that we're doing and the current committees that we have and the work that they're doing to make sure this all meshes together. Uh, the other thing I would point out in, in the uh, corridor in Pisgah Forest where we have the zoning, it's only properties that front the major highways. Only properties that front the main highways. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're, you're, you're that's, correct. That's the way I, rec I remember yeah. that. So um, if we could uh, do something along those lines that uh, does, not Im does not impact and impede our property owners, our business owners, and their ability to continue to grow and be successful, and uh, our ability to attract new business is something I give consideration to. Thank you. But that's a tall order. You know that. Well, I think it was. A, I think the uh, the challenge was trying to come up with a uh, ordinance, a zoning ordinance that would meet the city of Bavard, the residents, and Transylvania County commissioners about uh, four years ago, and we did it. Yes, we did. We we all we all uh, <clears throat> compromised quite a bit to get there too. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yes, Mark, sir. one last update from my standpoint, or maybe Artie can respond to this. Uh, if we had any at all email communications, uh, whispers, rumors, or anything from the biomass people since we passed our moratorium? Uh, I have had a, a discussion with one of the owners uh, who owns the property. Uh, and at that point, the uh, conversation was that uh, there probably would be no further action. Uh, if it was not definitive. I would not want to speak for the group, uh, but I've had uh, very little communication with the uh, investors from outside of uh, the county. And I only ask that question you're looking at timelines we're having to deal with, because yeah. I think that's the only thing that could be as far as dealing with a timeline and maybe we need to reassess that or maybe even try to get a definitive answer one way or the other because uh, that would be a major 
major consideration on you know how fast or what we've got to move because I uh, I don't want to move fast and miss something or do something that we want to regret later. But uh, you know, maybe we need to have that conversation with them. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just might add that uh, the attorney and I have been discussing that very thing, so we will okay. be having some information back the timing, to the commissioners you know, about that. The time pressure, that's only from there. So. Mark, I want to echo what Paige said about, uh, and, and all commissioners feel this way about the amount of work that's been put into this, and we appreciate that. And we're not making, as we say, not making any decisions or giving any direction tonight, but uh, that January timetable seems like a very feasible timetable for us to, to get, in, get direction to you and, and start that process. I'd like to again thank Chris Nanton and uh, Michelle McCall for helping with this, too. I would like to thank again everyone who came tonight. This is the beginning of this process. As you've heard, uh, over the next several months, we'll be looking at it uh, repeatedly. Uh, and uh, so we would invite you to all of the commissioner meetings that, that, that uh, all the commission meetings anyway, I see several people in here who do come to all the commission meetings, but certainly the commissioner meetings in which this will be in the agenda item. Again, thank you for coming this evening. Commissioners, in five minutes, 7.45, we'll, we'll sit back down and do that.